Welcome to a long overdue continuation in our series of user guides. And surprisingly, this is our first Ferrari item, and we've chosen today the F50. Now, the F50 was built between 1995 and 1997, just 349 units, and as the name would suggest, it was built and designed to celebrate 50 years of Ferrari. It was effectively the replacement for the F40 that was so popular that they'd gone on to build over 1,300 examples by the time they were finished in 1992. It was a very, very different car, however, to the F40. Unlike the F40 that was a steel frame wrapped in carbon Kevlar in order to stiffen it with a twin-turbo V8 and a manual gearbox, this was the first for Ferrari in terms of a all carbon fibre tub. It had lightweight aluminium suspension, unequal length wishbones at the front, push rod suspension. It had the engine mated to the tub, and more on that in a second. It was a 4.7 litre V12, producing just over 500 horsepower, which was actually derived from the 1990 641 F1 Ferrari. So a race derived engine, detuned although revving up to close to 9,000 revs at maximum peak power, as well as it being mated to a six-speed manual gearbox at the back there. So, fundamentally, a very basic and raw road car. And in today's market, they've become extremely popular, especially in the last couple of years, because at the time, I guess they didn't realise it, but, and they may surprise us with some models they bring out in the future, but as it stands, this was the last manual hypercar built by Ferrari, or their flagship car, if you like. And that means it, it's carved itself a very special place in the history of all the supercars. So much like Carrera GTs and the supercar and hypercar history that we see at the moment, they're very sought after because they seem to be the last of the manuals. This is the last manual supercar. But in terms of the technology behind it, and when you look at the blueprints of these cars, they were so clever, so sophisticated, very much a race car for the road. All carbon fibre bodywork and a style that, if you like, was an ev evolution and an evolved F40, but slightly softer in looks, still had that rear wing where other car designers at the time were going in a slightly softer, different direction. And on that note, we have to think that this car was launched pretty much alongside the McLaren F1. Now, we all know what's happened with the McLaren F1, and we know about the McLaren F1's simplicity of design. Therefore, you can see this was a very different proposition and perhaps why it's been so overlooked in recent years. But the values really are coming back now. Now, they're not approaching McLaren F1 values, but given where they were two or three years ago, they have seen a massive increase. And we've been very busy with these cars. Six units sold so far in 2021 alone. Uh, and I'm sure that by the, by the end of the year, we may even get into double digits with the way things are going. But back to the, the user's guide. So... First of all, we'll start under the front. We've got a front clamshell, very much like an F40, that hinges forwards. And the way to get into the front, so we open the driver's door, and down in the footwell here, we've got a lever, which we pull, and that releases it. And then we just lift it. We can lift it, unlike an F40, where you really need two people. This will happily lift from either side, and up it opens. So, under the front here, we don't have as generous a luggage space as the F40, where you've got the whole entire spare wheel well. But we do have these two luggage pouches. One under the front side of the clamshell, where you have this suit carrier bag to put some of your jackets or blazers or a complete suit in. And in the front here, you've got this second bag, which some people call the medicine bag or for your toiletries or wash bag. It's, again, quite a big one. And sometimes you'll even find a car that has its original Todd boots in there. But for the full package of what a car could have come with originally, watch our parts video on the YouTube channel, which demonstrates that. So they fit in here. And also, all of the luggage should be supplied in these yellow dust covers with the prancing horse on the front. So if you're looking at an F50 and it's got a complete luggage set, make sure it's also got the dust covers with it also. Additionally, in the front here, we've got this... ID plate here, which is its build number or its, its number in the production run. We've got the battery cutoff switch on the driver's side here, so it's a simple twist anti clockwise to turn on and turn it clockwise to turn it off again. Then on this side, on the driver's side, we've got the windscreen washer fluid filler, and under this carbon cover, we have one toolkit, and this will contain your spanners and bits and pieces like that.
Moving over to the passenger side, again, we've got a similar compartment to the other side. And under this carbon cover, we have the spare fuses, as well as inside this leather pouch, again made by Scudoni, the wheel socket. And the final item on this side, next to the fuse box cover here, so you lift this, and this is where all your fuses are, is the tyre inflator, which I'm sure will never come into use, but should be there, it is nice to see. A couple of other extra little details on this side. You actually have the assembly number plaque here, so not the production number, but the assembly number on this side, as well as a few little, bit of, little bits of information. And finally, on the front bulkhead, you've got the colour code sticker. So at this time, all the paint supplied to Ferrari was by Glazurip, and this colour, of course, is Rosso Corsa. So that's it for under here, and a little anecdote. Back in the days when these cars were much more affordable and uh, actually we did lots more mileage in them. I remember going to Le Mans a couple of times and having plastic bags full of loose clothes and tying them up and sealing them and stuffing them in these two front corners here just so we could have a little bit of extra space. And then of course toothbrush and toothpaste in the, uh, in the main bag. When it comes to closing the front clam there are two ways to do it. You could either drop it from a small height but my preferred way to do it is to drop it down onto the catches and then close it one side at a time. So just place the, place the palm of your hand close to the mirror here till it clicks closed. So one side, then the other. Now whilst we're here, both mirrors can fold in, which it is a very, very wide car indeed, so that is quite useful. So we'll move on to the interior next. Obviously on both sides you've got this external door catch. There's no central locking. And much like an F40, you lock it using the small key on the outside here or from the inside, pushing it down. But they're not actually linked. So if it's locked from the outside, it's locked from the outside and you can't open it from the inside. In the spirit of being a lightweight, both sides, manual windows. So I'm just going to drop this window for the ease of filming. But if we look in here across the cockpit, we've got these great bucket seats which have this immense sort of side bolster detail, very F50. They've got flannel centres, very reminiscent of the Dinos of the 70s, especially the 206s. So on the red cars, they have red centres, and on some of the other cars, you'll see different coloured centres. We've seen yellow, we've seen black, but all the red cars will be red. As standard, all the F50s had recall inertia seat belts, so no harnesses as standard, although you can fit them, and they've got the space in the seats to, to have that. And just next to the seat here, we've got this pouch here to put in anything you want to put there. Unlike the F40, again, actually the back of the seat is reclinable, so you've got a little roller on the side here to recline the seat backwards or forwards, and actually you can have a really quite comfortable seating position, especially as a passenger, over a long journey. So, climbing into the driver's side, it's, uh, it's an easier place to get into than the F40. You haven't got that huge sill in your way, but you're still very, very aware that you're in this carbon tub. You know, everything around you is carbon fibre. It's got this really dominant central spine. The uh, rubber mats are bonded into the tub itself. There's no carpet, so it's just the rubber mats to stop you damaging everything. You've got this additional rubber pad on the sill here to stop you scuffing it with your loafers as you get in. And here's the uh, wind-up window. And everything's just a little bit more elaborate than the F40. There's a lot more thought that's gone into it. You know, the design of the carbon panels, the way in which the opening uh, mechanism works and the little pocket that's in the door here and the little leather bits and pieces. So now we're sitting here in the driver's seat. It's again a very simple steering wheel, almost like a softened, more modern version of the F40 wheel. There's no airbag, it's just the traditional Ferrari horn from back in the day with a Cavallino Rampanti in the middle and of course a little horn sign above it. On the dash we've got these vents that we see sort of we saw first feature in Daytonas and Dinos back in the 70s which have run all the way through to the mid 90s I expect this was probably the last car that we saw something like this on so you've got vents in the center here and again on the top of the dash here and you've got this lovely Alcantara dash which always feels a bit wobbly when it's like that but once you turn the aircon on it seems to stretch itself flat so that's for your demist function and then there's this rear view mirror which is a really strange shape unless you have the car in roads to format and then you realise that the shape of the left hand side from the driver's viewpoint 
you won't see anything in a mirror here because that's where the roll hoop is and that's where the shape of the roads to set up is. So it's shaped so that all you can see is what you would be able to see with the roads to set up in place and not have it over the top sized or too big. And again, it's actually body colored the mirror, which is quite a cool thing and unique to, to these F50s. Any F50 can be presented in Roadster or Coupe format, but it's not a straightforward job. It requires the services of a workshop. Looking at the dash, so we've got all our vents shut now. We've got this carbon fiber panel in front of us, the little F50 badge on the front here. We've got our open gate six speed manual gearbox with reverse on top of that. Then in the middle here, we've got super basic air conditioning uh, controls. So we've got our fan that starts it off, goes all the way to maximum. Uh, and then from cold to hot on the right hand side there. We've got a traditional handbrake, so it's not a fly off, it's a traditional handbrake. In the middle, we've got our hazard light switch, which you can turn on and off. And then at the back here, we've got our torch. Now this torch is really cool because it's demountable, so you can take it away and use it as a torch. But also, when it's plugged in here, when you open the doors, it acts as your cockpit light. So there isn't actually, because of the Roadster Coupe setup, there isn't actually an interior light, this acts as your interior light, and this often goes missing. So again, it's something to make sure you look for. And then finally, in the, in the middle, in the centre here, we've got this pouch, which is actually where your instruction manual and your service book should live. So it's one of the few Ferraris ever that doesn't actually have a pouch for the books to live in. And quite often people say to me, oh, I've got my F50, but it doesn't have the pouch for the books. Well, that's right, because the pouch in this model only was actually fitted into the interior of the car and in the middle. Behind the seats here, there's this little ledge here, and these belts are for the Roadster roof. So when you've got the car in Roadster set up, you've got the soft top roof, which is a canvas roof with a metal frame. The metal frame folds up, the canvas roof folds around it, it goes into a capote bag, and then that lives behind the seats here and is strapped in with these belts so that when you want to quickly put your roof back on again, you can put them there. And again, a little anecdote about living with an F50. If you're going on a long journey, you're probably better off having it in coupe format so that you can leave that at home and have that extra space for a couple of soft bags. Starting the car is much like an F40. So we've got the barrel next to the steering column, key in, turn it, and then the lovely push start button. So on to one of the best parts of an F50 is this fantastic dash, completely digital. So you turn it off, it's a black screen. You can't see any dials whatsoever. You've just got the two needles. So you turn it on and it lights up and it gives you all this information. So on the left-hand side, we've got fuel level from naught to four quarters. We've got oil temperature, we've got oil pressure, we've got water temperature, we've got some warning signs at the bottom. We've got the rev counter that goes from naught right up to that red line at eight and a half thousand revs and, or just a little bit over. And this speeder that goes from naught to 360 kilometers an hour. And in the bottom right hand corner there, you'll see this interesting little screen which lets us scroll through using these two buttons here. So we've got one on the left and one on the right. So using the right hand button to scroll through, we can go through all the different functions that we can control. So stopping here on the gear lever function, you can turn on or off whether it tells you what gear you're in. And then moving on, one thing that people always get caught out on, this is the LED brightness of the screen. So we get there using the right one, and it's on 30 at the moment, which is maximum brightness. But if we use the left button, we can scroll through back to zero, and you see how the screen goes off. One, two, three, four, and then we go all the way up to 30, and it gradually gets brighter so that you can control the brightness of this screen and then we finish up on 30, full brightness. The other functions let you set the time, they let you um, decide whether you're looking at the mileage or the trip meter, uh, and that's that. In a slightly traditional manner, which is unusual for this car, we've got three stalks, so on the left, the little one is the left and right, got that classic F50 sound. On the right hand column, we've got the windscreen wiper, and then the left hand one. Twist to turn the side lights on, down for dip, down one more for main, up for dip, all the way up for off and turn the side lights off by going back round again. Finally, the three buttons on the left hand side here. Fog, fog off, heated screen, 
heated screen off, lift function, the front will rise up, it tells me in the inf information screen, the bottom right hand corner, that the front's up. And then to let it down, we just press it again, and down it goes. As a precaution, it's suggested never to leave the lift up when the car is parked, as this can overstrain the pump and cause it to fail. Therefore, whenever you leave the car parked, leave the nose down, or only leave the nose up when you're trying to get over a speed bump or similar. Right, enough about the interior. Let's do the final part, the engine bay. Before I open the rear panel, fuel filler. On this car, it's only on one side. It's on the driver's side. It doesn't have a locking fuel cap. It's got a simple lift panel here, and then you just unscrew the cap, remove and fuel up. Simple as that. And actually, whilst we're talking about it, this design here is so cool because it's the fuel filler cap. It's very reminiscent of a 250 Ferrari's oil filler cap. And actually, the oil filler cap in the engine bay looks the same. And I, I would go so far as to say that these are almost identical or perhaps the same as the actual knobs that are used on the sides of the seats for the uh, recline operation. So really cool little feature that with Ferrari on it, fe featured all over the car. So to open the rear clam, in the driver's door shut here, we've got this little black lever. You pull this and it will open at the back. Move around to the back, lift it in the middle of the spoiler, not either side, and it should lift straight up. And once you've elevated it, you get it to the full height position and you pull these two bars back, one side at a time, so that they lock. Now I said that you know, it's important that you lift in the middle of the rear and that's really, really important because this Perspex screen is very delicate. And if you twist the rear clam too much, you can actually crack that rear Perspex screen, which is a very expensive replacement. Added to which, sometimes these locking mechanisms don't release that easily due to the unequal length of the cables from the single latch release to the different sides. So what it might be a good idea is to have a couple of people helping you if they're on hand, that one person pulls the latch and another person opens it, making sure they open it from the middle so that it works because it doesn't always pan out that easily. So looking at this engine bay, I mentioned earlier that I think that this is a superior design to an Enzo in some ways. And what I mean by that is the end of this car in terms of the chassis the carbon tub, the monocoque, ends absolutely where the rear window is. And from that point backwards, there is no chassis frame whatsoever. And I absolutely mean that. No chassis frame whatsoever. So just like the uh, technique that was adopted from the 70s onwards in Formula One cars and racing cars thereafter, this is exactly how the F50 is. The engine bolts onto that rear bulkhead. The gearbox bolts onto the engine and all of the suspension is mounted on the gearbox casing. It's an incredibly clever design. And when they went to the Enzo, they actually moved away from this and they extended some legs out of the back of the, of the tub so that the, the engine could be supported in some sort of minor cradle. And the reason they did that was people comment on the way the F50 sounds on the interior and it's a very noisy atmosphere. It's like a, almost like a bag of spanners being rattled r around behind you. And that's because the engine's solidly mounted to the back of the tub. So it gives you that real sort of harsh noise, especially with this engine, which is a race-derived unit. What they wanted to do in the Enzo was soften that. But again, that's why I love the F50, because it's so raw, it's so visceral. It's, it's an absolute driver's car. You made it with that manual gearbox. It's just a, a mega thing. So like I said before, you've got this really complex gear casing, which is you know, not only the gearbox, but it is the top wishbone support mounts the lower wishbone support mounts go onto the bottom of the gearbox casing and you've got all of that pivoting push rod shocks and um, uh, springs mounted into the middle of the car. It's completely unlike an F40 that has its traditional turrets. It's really clever. It's very race car. It's very Formula One. That's why I love the F50. And actually so sort of stressed is this member that in the workshop we often see that you can take off the rear clam the inner rear wheel arches, and then simply disconnect the gearbox from the engine and roll the whole rear suspension, exhausts, 
rear bumper, everything in one section away from the car to reveal the clutch and flywheel and then put it back together again. It's not a complete stripped down job. I'm not saying that it saves hours on maintenance, it's still a complex job, but it's just really cool to see the car sitting there and see the way the engine hangs off the tub like that. It's, it was uh, you know, very much a racing car for the road and something that I don't think people necessarily understand about the F50. But as I mentioned, it does give it a harshness to its drive and a harshness to the cockpit and cabin experience, but it's part of the reason why this car, I think, is an unrepeatable, very special part of Ferrari's history. So owing to this design that we've talked about, it means that all of the wishbones are on, on display, as well as being able to see right up to the bulkhead there, you see the whole exhaust system, that beautiful manifold system, rolling into the cats, over and through the suspension into these big back boxes, which often people in the past have replaced, but there's a huge emphasis on originality these days, and people really like to see an original exhaust. Believe it or not, second-hand systems, complete systems, can trade for up to £50,000 or more today if you haven't got it for your car. So, you know, if you're looking at buying an F50, do make sure that you try and make sure it has the original exhaust system. To my mind, the best thing to do to make them a little bit noisier is to wire open these valves. It sounds fabulous when it's on full chat, that V12 engine. It's really good. And then on top of the engine, we've got this carbon fibre inlet plenum manifold with the two feeds to the two air boxes on both sides. These always fade in terms of the lacquer for some reason on one side to the other in the centre. It always fades differently, so one part sometimes looks a bit yellower than others, and it's a good indicator of mileage and age of the car and the amount of use and the heat that's gone through the engine bay. And then moving back here, we've got the oil tank filler. So this is where you fill up the dry sump tank for, for the, uh, the engine oil. That's on top of the gearbox mounted here. All really super clever stuff. But that's that in the back there. I don't think there's much more that I could advise a user on from that point of view. And closing the rear end, it's lift up the back, move these two forwards. That one's done it on its own. Put it down slowly. And then, like the front, push down on one side at a time until they click. So that's our user's guide for the F50. I hope you've enjoyed it. Stay tuned and tune into our YouTube channel for more of the same. And let us know what you'd like to see next. Thanks very much.